Yeah, so welcome everyone again officially to our week on results in this Nebula program. Um, so I am, um, I'm going to pass it over to Austin, who is now joined <laughs> and will do the, the welcome. Austin. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Eileen, uh, for covering me up. Uh, colleagues, uh, sorry for breaking up. I uh, have bad internet connection from, from, from where I am. Yeah, but uh, as Eileen has mentioned, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are so excited to uh, do an another day of the call. I'm quite sure, Eileen, you have talked about the code of conduct and the community participation guidelines. Not yet. You can um, continue ah, okay. with that. Ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, this call will be recorded and transcribed. So uh, if you mind, you may turn on your webcam. If you don't mind, please don't. Uh, and the video thereafter will be available on the YouTube channel so that uh, you can be able to refer to it later on. Uh, you may have changed with the internet as I do. Yeah, so I'm able to uh, get the most of the information and the captions are also available uh, via Zoom. So you can enable them clicking the CC button. So you can be able to, to read as well. So just minor, minor code of conduct and community participation guidelines. So we, we, we make sure that we encourage everyone to participate. Uh, so it's an open forum where uh, everyone is expected to participate. And uh, we are all committed to building a community for all. So please, 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 please uh, be considerate and respectful for um, everyone or for each other. And remember that we are a world, uh, world community, so you might not be communicating in someone else's primary language, so please. Uh, that's where uh, the captions are becoming so important, and then you can also refer to uh, the, the channel, that the YouTube channel, uh, the video that will be recorded. But uh, also very important is that if you experience any, any or witness any unacceptable behavior, please, please, please uh, don't hesitate uh, to, to contact the organizers, CEO, uh, Mafika and Eileen. Uh, they are more than willing to, to, to assist. And uh, if you report on any issues involving one of the organizers, please email one of the members individually. Yeah, so, and uh, just to hint on the breakout rooms and participation later on, so we'll have breakout rooms and participation. So please, if you prefer by speaking, just add an S uh, to your name. That's is spoken participation and discussion. So if you prefer uh, written, just add W to, to, to your name. So that means you'll be a portion of the Yeah, so we are so excited, uh, colleagues. Uh, this time around, you'll be able to, to, to have Daniel who will be able to present. She's so experienced and uh, she has done a lot of research in, uh, in open science. So we are excited to learn from her. I'm excited to learn from her. I'm quite sure you're also excited uh, to learn from her. I'm not sure. Uh, Daniela, have you introduced yourself? Maybe uh, I colleagues can. would like I to know you. Ken, thank you so much, Austin, for, uh, thank you so much. for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, it's really exciting. I was just telling Irene before I joined that I did this for the first cohort that it feels like it's been a year, but it's actually just been a few months. And I yeah. had to update some slides because things have changed. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's exciting to, to continue to, um, to learn. I'm learning as well as I go along. Uh, and you set the expectations of seeing kind of high for me. So now I'm going to live up to them. <laughs> Um, my name is, uh, actually, let me just um, share my screen. Uh, the slides are linked um, in the in the pad, um, so you're going to have access to them as well. Um, let me just go into slideshow. Do you see the full screen? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Minimize this. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a uh, cohort two. Um, uh, excited to meet you all. I'm Daniela Saderi. I also go by Danny. Uh, I'm the executive director and co-founder of Pre-Review, uh, which I'm, I'm just going to say two words at the end um, about uh, this presentation is licensed to buy 4.0. So uh, we're going to think, I believe we're going to post it on Zenodo. So uh, feel free to uh, reuse um any content, obviously, unless there is different attribution of some specific content in there. <clears throat> Oops. Um, 
There we go. Um, this is the notepad link. You already have it. Um, all right. So um, this is my the, the the kind of the four petals of my of my life. Uh, no. So I am a neuroscientist by training. So in the app left corner, it's just a photo from when I was a PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm Italian. Um, I was raised and born in Italy and then came to the United States in Portland, Oregon, where I'm currently living to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and some way, uh, somewhere around like maybe like my fourth year, um, <clears throat> I started, I stumbled upon the open science movement. This was like 2016 um, and met a, an incredible community uh, of change makers from all around the world. Um, and that would include you today. Um, and I was uh, captured um, into this space and still finished my PhD, uh, but really like that changed uh, how I did it and, you know, kind of seeded uh, some of the um, interests that then I continue to pursue with a uh, pre-review. So down here in the bottom left is a photo um, of me with a Mozilla a uh, Firefox mascot and another Open Science Fellow. So during my last year, I was an Open Science Fellow for uh, with Mozilla. Uh, so that opened up a lot of doors for me to um, kind of pursue this dream of uh, pre-review, um, which I co-founded with uh, Samantha Hindle and Monica Granados, who you'll see on the upper right. right. Um, and we're still friends and still co-founders and still working together, which is wonderful. Um, and then I live in Portland with my two children, Mira and Lev, and my husband um, and my two cats. All right. So uh, jumping right in, we're going to start with a question. Um, and I think, um, you know, just in thinking about like how the, when I got into research, um, I wasn't thinking at all about all these things. It's like, when, where, and how do I share my research? Like I was thinking about doing the research and then I was like, someone else will they'll guide me to think about what do I do, you know, at the very end. And I think that obviously, you know, now having learned, it's actually a very good question to ask. These are good questions to ask before you have, uh, you're done uh, with your research. Um, but just in general, like if we think about historically, how the research and, uh, and where and, and when it was shared, you know, we can trace it back to when there were letters going from one uh, scholar to another um, explaining what the research was. So that was kind of the way of um, quote unquote getting feedback or if you will, like just a way to um, affirm uh, someone's ego, you know, however you want to see, but the, it was not a very open communication of uh, research findings. Um, and obviously, as we as kind of progressed, um, that have been um, in the recent, I don't know, I don't even know when conference started, but um, uh, kind of gatherings of researchers um, with opportunity to share the research um, along when it's done along the way. So poster sessions usually um, uh, have a kind of data that has been collected and give the opportunity to the presenter to kind of get some feedback uh, before the the you know, the research is published in a journal. This is not always true. There are always also posters of research that has already been published. But what I'm trying to say is that kind of with, um, you know, publication and the way that we shared our research has evolved and continues to evolve. And obviously with the, um, uh, uh, you know, with the internet um, that uh, the publication, you know, like the, the journal and the paper, uh, uh, it, which is still, you know, present, but has definitely like uh, evolved into, into something else, like the e-publication, just putting your research, um, even journals themselves, a lot of journals now are only um, digital. And so that has, has changed even more, like the um, broaden the access to um, to reading publications and obviously with a more sophisticated indexing, we can now find research much better. Mm -hmm. But um, it's still true that even in the era of the internet um, and you know when journal, when articles are there somewhere in the database, not everyone can access them. So there is still um, kind of, there are still walls and barriers that um, need to be uh, teared down. And that's why we're here. We're just gonna break the walls and open up um, research even more. So I'm going to, this is our first activity. This is no breakout room, but I think it's, it's um, 
to me, it's fun to think about some of these questions. So we, we talked about the how and the where and a little bit, you know, and the when, but um, if we get to the why, I think the why is what is that? It's always my favorite of the old W's, but like, why do we want to share our research? Like, why do we get into science? I think back, like what motivated me to get into science? And if you can think of like, don't overthink it, but just like what comes to mind if you want to answer this question, why would you, why would a researcher or yourself, if you are a researcher, want to share your research? What's the main goal of that? And um, there is a, a prompt in the ether, in the, uh, Notepad, sorry, Etherpad is the old version of it. And um, I would like to invite you to take a few minutes just to brainstorm a couple of motivating factors of why someone would share the research or you, if you're a researcher yourself. And then again, that doesn't have to be too complex. Um, and then what I would like to do after that is to invite you to think about, to pick one of those motivating factors, that one that kind of speaks to you the most. It can be one that you wrote or one that someone else wrote. And then think about if I had to decide when that research should be shared, just based on that motivating fact. So like my goal is to share my research because blah, blah, blah. Um, then you think about, okay, if I want to reach that goal, in what point in time should I publish that research? And um, with whom would I like to share it? So these are just some kind of thought provoking uh, questions I hope and we can just you can just jot down ideas and then we can have a short discussion uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll see if there are any questions um and then we can dive in into content but I just wanted to start and we can also use the chat I don't know if uh, I'll see people are pretty used to the notepad um or there are other ways is this clear to everybody uh, are we gonna take we're gonna take a couple of minutes on one question and then as I see that things are written, I'm gonna prompt the second question, but you go ahead. Can I see yeah. some thumbs up uh, or oh okay, go ahead, Austin. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Daniela, for, for that uh, brilliant introduction. I'm quite sure uh our, our participants they are used for both, uh, for, for the chat and the uh, and and the but I think they should right. be able to 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 give responses, so we should be able to yeah. to 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 go point out. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And I see that yeah, responses sure. are just coming already. So uh, maybe I can. Yeah. That's awesome. I can share my screen in that. Thank you. Mm. Here we go. If you've done writing your motivating factor and you read others and you really like that, you can also plus one at the end of that um, just to reinforce. Um, not that there is a right or wrong, but um, so we're going to take a, um, another minute on this and then we can uh, move to the next. So if you're done writing, you can read others.
Now, as you finish your thoughts on this prompt, um, please continue. And if you have finished your thought, you want to pick your favorite or your top motivating factor from the list, um, I invite you to take that and bring it down to the next prompt and think about if that was my goal, when should my research be shared? At what point did the research cycle? And with whom? And I invite you to just try to not think about how it's done right now. Uh, think about, again, if you were in a space in which you could just focus on that goal, how would you, when would you do it and with whom? And if that question doesn't make sense and you want to answer a different question, is around that, like the where or some other of those questions, please do feel free. This is just a, a thought exercise for all of us. We're going to take one more minute and then we're going to spend a couple of minutes uh, discussing it if anyone would like to share um, their thoughts by unmuting. I see the writing slow down. Um, I'm definitely, uh, I see a lot of common uh, thoughts here. Um, I'm not going to read them aloud. You can all obviously read it yourself, but I wonder if uh, anyone, I'm going to stop sharing for a sec. Um, does anyone would like to um, unmute and then share aloud what they were thinking? We, we can't spend too much time here, but um, I'm curious if someone would like to share. I know I love the notepad rainbow. It's literally so is my favorite. All right. Well, um, just in commenting uh briefly what I see here, um, you know, it seems like a, a, a good amount of people to think that sharing uh, to also get feedback is a is a very good motivator. I'm obviously biased, I agree. <laughs> I work at free review. <laughs> um, but also like um the motivating factor is just that share knowledge with the communities that are directly involved with the problem. So like that idea of uh, helping um, society and the community affected with whatever from whatever that uh, we are studying, by whatever we're studying, um, to learn and progress knowledge. So um, I, um, there are many, there's a lot of, lot of uh, good, good motivators here. Um, and so based on that, does anyone want to share like, what was it, their thought around how, how would that motivator fa motivating factor will shape the answer to the second question? Mm 
beg your pardon yeah please oh would you would you like to share what your thoughts uh, around these questions i see that oh someone on muting no i can't tell okay i'm gonna just move on then but i see that you know uh some people are like well we should share it when it's complete and we're confident that it's accurate uh, I would like to offer a challenge to that. Um, when is research ever 100% accurate? It's uh, <laughs> it's rare. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, if uh, if th that would be, but if the goal is to get feedback, um, you know, arguably you can say, you know, there is a sweet spot when you have some coherent uh, uh, thoughts there, but you also want to get feedback uh, sooner. But, you know, this is different people think differently. And the research should be shared with different community sectors using different tools. And so today we're gonna see a few of these tools. Um, so thank you for participating in this thought exercise with me. I'm just gonna resume sharing and move on with the slides, but hopefully some of this question will kind of come back or the answers will come back as we move through the presentation. All right. So here is a, a research pipeline more than cycle or like a, um, you know, just a graphic um, from the module five lesson form from NASA tops. So you may recognize this, but it's basically, um, you know, from left to right, uh, showing um, a schematic of the progression of research object um, production. So, but also the thought of, of producing research. So you like think about the research and perhaps you're doing this in community with your colleagues and your, um, if you have a supervisor um, and then, uh, oftentimes you're encouraged to write a proposal. Um, uh, so like just a, you know, if you want to get funding, but also like a kind of a proposal to yourself to say like this or to your committee to say, this is what I would like to do. And, and, and at that point, it's actually very useful already to get feedback if you can. Um, but usually that feedback remains within a short, a small group of people. And then you start the planning, the project planning. Um, and Ingrid, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read all of these um, uh, these parts here, but like before we get to that last step of reporting and publishing um, our research, there are a lot of other kind of outputs and a lot of other actions that happen, and uh, different kind of feedback uh, gets um, uh, to those to those uh, outputs. Uh, depending on you know where you are, who are your colleagues, um, and uh, how you and when you decide to to share that more broadly. Um, so what is interesting is that traditionally a lot of that is kind of an obscure and opaque process. So unless you until you go through it yourself, um, mm -hmm. it's it's not very uh, clear uh, what really happens in that. So I don't remember ever being trained. Mm -hmm. Um, in these steps and how to go about them, when to ask for help, when to question. It was kind of a given, okay? You're in research, you're a student, you're just supposed to, this is your final goal is publishing it, good luck. And maybe some of you are luckier and you have a better uh, support, but it was more like a lot of learning was kind of passively from like seeing my colleagues struggle through it. So that last step is kind of uh, the more kind of uh, less opaque, However, there is a lot of opacity also in that publication step, as we're going to see uh, in a minute. In fact, uh, the peer review process itself is often depicted as the black box where you just put the, your baby, the research that you've been doing and pouring your blood and tears into, into this black box. And somehow it will come out either being accepted or uh, just go to the trash can and you don't really know what happened there. I mean, you can read the reviews, but like how the process happened is kind of a, a question uh, that not many know the answer to unless you are like in publishing and an editor. So you just submit this and then hope. Um, and the peer review process is also often depicted as real, like kind of war-like. Um, this war zone of going through uh, unarmed through a, a tunnel of people ready to take you down. Um, and this is, to me, is one of the most toxic aspects of this, because it really takes away the joy of wanting to help the communities with that are affected by the research, takes the joy of uh, wanting to share with our colleagues so that we can all contribute to knowledge, knowledge production. But it is the reality. And so the publish or perish um, um, model is also depicted here with like literally 
death at the end of this process. Um, so, you know, that are, um, this is sorry, it just came all at once, but um, that are with open science that brings a lot of opportunity to try to kind of chip at this opaque, you know, kind of that cloud and make it more and more uh, visible. So this slide is just to show, this is just one example that are, it's not even the example, but what I like about this is, so this is called the Life Cycle Journal and it's a pilot that the Center for Open Science is just about to start. Uh, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is not because it's a D model that there's been a lot of other, but what I like about, you know, uh, this is that it shows, you know, if you look at the standard journal, you basically like all of the things that I showed before in the cloud are these parts where you plan and then, you know, like you, you get some feedback and you conduce the, the, you do the research, um, you get some reviews from, if you submit it to a grant, uh, you get some reviews, but they're not public, like all of that is um is kind of hidden uh and then the review and revise uh process is um the process like still hidden but it's like kind of involving the standard it's what the standard journals kind of care about so what this process is trying to do for the life cycle journals is trying to kind of bring to the surface um all of these steps uh so that uh, at the, every point of the research cycle you have um an output that is published and it's um amenable to reviews so the community can provide reviews uh, all the way from the registered report which i'm going to show you what it are, they are in a second um to the final version of record um of the publication um and i know that i might use words that are not common here but i'm going to clarify some of that. The, the final version of record is the usually defined like the, the final paper that has been peer reviewed and it's like gets the identifier that is like finalized. Uh, this idea has been challenged in the open science movement. It's like there is, you know, rarely a time in which you can say this is done and it will never be changed, but it's also kind of like a, um, a way to have a, um, a record of the final version that is always findable. So um, I wanted a couple of things that, uh, that are not always familiar. This concept of pre-registration and registered report, reports are more common in psychology and sociology. Has anyone heard of these before? Can, can you do a, let me just see if I can. Can I see it uh, in the chat if anyone has heard of these concepts before? Well, I hadn't um, until I came to the open science movement. Um, and in fact, it's still something that is definitely not common in neuroscience, um, or it wasn't when I left um, academia. But so pre-registration is this idea that, so as you're developing the idea and you design the study, um, you submit, you kind of submit the, uh, the, the design of the study uh, to a repository. And then you go on and collect and analyze the data, and then you write the report and you publish it. So there is a record out there of what you said you would do uh, in your research. And it's okay if it's not gonna be exactly what you end up doing, but what's nice about this is that someone who's really interested in the process can also see, hey, like what was the, in, in the, in the published report, you can say, this is what we plan to do, or you can link to the pre-registration and you say, but this is what happened. And this is a much, more it's like a much more real way of how science happens and i actually really like that um but the peer review is still uh happens kind of at the level of the final of the final publication with a, usually a journal controlling it the registered reports are similar um but they actually allow for a stage of review. So there is an actual review that happens at the level of the design study. And usually this happens if you're submitting a proposal to a funder, but um, this is actually like something that Lifecycle Journal is gonna bring more to the standard when you get peer review at kind of uh, more stages. And, and there's uh, one more stage with the peer review preprints that is not reported in the scheme schematic. If you want to learn more about it, so report of registration, there are um, some links there um, to, um, to learn more. So um, you might have already encountered this in other sessions um, of open results um, and maybe even data, but I wanted to have at least one slide of persistent identifiers, identifiers or PIDs. 
so there are identifiers. Mm -hmm. The more identifiers we can have that are unique, um, the more we can connect scholarly outputs uh, with one another, not just scholarly outputs, but also people, the scholars themselves. So, so up here, uh, we have ORCID. Um, I really encourage you all, you probably already already have an ORCID ID, but if you don't, please do make an ORCID ID. That will be a unique identifier of just you. And you know, probably there are other Daniela Saderi in the world. Uh, so it's nice to have uh, someone that can kind of track, track back to, to me um, and I can use to kind of build my, um, my portfolio of research outputs. But also there are identifiers for data sets, identifiers obviously for publications, um, identifiers for organizations and different, all of these kind of or, um, organizations here um, are pr providers of identifiers for different um, for the different objects, all so the funders and the grants and projects. So the more we can kind of have this persistent identifier, the easier it gets to cite um, and uh, create a scholarly record that is robust and sustainable. So here I have a fun, a uh, little fun game. Um, I don't know if it's fun, but uh, if um, I invite you to write in the chat, which one of these four um, uh, of, of strings, <laughs> I don't know what you call the text, uh, is not a persistent identifier, which one is the intruder? Um, in this list. So you can write in the chat. It's okay if you don't get it right. It's not, nobody's <laughs> just, just an opportunity to talk about it. <coughs> So can you find the intruder or which one of these four links or four strings of text is not a persistent identifier? Mm -hmm. Just gonna stop sharing for just a second to see if there's anyone raising their hands or. Okay. Uh, I see yeah. three, four, three. Um, okay, can anyone, uh, would anyone like to share why they think that three is not or four? No, you just want me to reveal. Okay, let's reveal. <laughs> uh, if you have access to the slides, you probably have seen it, but um, actually the answer is two. So. Uh, the first one is the DOI, or Digital Object Identifier. So it's like there's an auto, I guess that's uh, nobody caught that trap, um, got into that trap. But the second one um, is actually just a link to um, a page on GitHub. It's a great page. You should go there. The Alan Turing Institute of the Turing Way, they're awesome. There's a lot of great content there, but it's not a repository. And actually, you know, the people that maintain that GitHub repository can go now and change what's in there. So that's not a persistent identifier. It will not always re bring you to that content. That content can be changed. The characteristics of a, of a PID is that once you have that code, usually the content cannot change. So for example, on Zenodo, you can actually create versions of the publication, but it will have a different number if you change the content. Um, so that it, there will always be a unique number that tracks to the same exact content. And this third one is an international standard book number, uh, which has to be purchased uh, by publishers by the international SBN agency. I really didn't know what this was before I did this, this exercise, but it is persistent. Uh, and this last, last, last one is the Internet Archive um, that also kind of seemingly, same, it's a DOI basically, uh, kind of like Zenodo does. So fun facts. All right. Um, and do please interrupt me if you want me to stop. But um, so that is enough for kids. Um, here I just brought up like the, again, another kind of nice um, flower of the open science. And, and through this, this course, you have been exposed already to some of these, you know, bits uh, that make up open science. I think that there are more than, than in here. I hope you don't hear this horrible sound that comes from outside. Um, but um, so of these components and important components for today's lecture is the open access 
there. And even within, it looks like, oh, it's a very compact and understandable, you know, open access, access to knowledge. Um, it is probably the most like evolving ever, no, I don't know if it's the most, but like it's complex in the sense that there are many different kinds of doing open access. There are many different, um, uh, me not meanings, but, um, oh my gosh, uh, definitions of open access. And here I just reported one from the, Buda the Budapest Open Access Initiative Declaration. There are so many declarations that starts with the B. Uh, you will find the Berlin Declaration, the Budapest Declaration, the more recent um, uh, Barcelona Declaration that are all around open access in some way. Um, but, and I, I don't, you don't need to go and look them all up, but just wanted to say, if you hear them, they're not exactly the same thing, but here is just a definition of like open access to the literature, meaning freely available content to the public using the internet and permitting anyone to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, full text articles, and use them in any other lawful purpose, so lawful, depending on the license, we're going to touch on that. Um, and the role of the copyright should only be to give the authors control over the integrity of their work. So when you publish generally to a journal that is not open access, and even some open access we're going to see is a database that can help us navigate this complexity, um, you don't retain often you don't retain the copyright. You as an author submit to a journal and when the journal publishes your work, they can take the copyright, which means that they have the right to um, do whatever they want with that uh, research, make it not available, um, and you lose the control effectively of, that, uh, of the right of your own research, which is a problem that open access um, really tried to, you know, from the get-go of 25 plus years ago to get, um, have to change. If I say things that are wrong, by the way, and Irena, you also have a lot of knowledge here and everyone here, please do um, please do interrupt me or ask questions. Um, I am not an open access expert. So I just <laughs> prepared some of these slides, but um, here is um, uh, just a kind of also a fun, another fun thing that you may hear when people refer to open access. There's just not one way to do open access which is great because we need experimentations. We can have one solution that fits all needs. Um, and so here you go, you have a few flavors of open access um, and these are just primarily business models. So how do we move away from the more traditional kind of a, a publishing system in which the authors pay to publish and the authors pay to read <laughs> To something that is more fair um, and when you know we don't need to um, and the readers that especially of publicly funded research doesn't have to pay for reading uh, so that would be a lot of effort has been put in the gold open access I'm not going to go into too much details here but I want to highlight the gold open access the green and the diamond so the gold open access is where the authors still pay they actually pay an author processing charge APC to make the content of the research available and retain, often retain the copyright. So as you can imagine, that is good for the readers because they no longer have to pay to read, but you still have to pay to publish as the authors. And that puts a lot of strains uh, on, on authors who are, um, you know, are not able to, to pay fees that are as high as twelve, thirteen thousand $13,000 for one publication. So uh, that's not great. Uh, and a lot of people are just moving away from that. However, a lot of, you know, that's is still prominent. And so there are other routes to open access um, and like the green on a OA that I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna talk about in a minute and the diamond OA, which is where basically no readers or publishers uh, or authors pay. Uh, so there is zero cost to read um, or two, which sounds amazing, right? But there are different ways of letting people like someone needs to pay. So um, there are different proposals of how that can happen. I'm not gonna linger too much on that. So um, before I get into Greenaway, I wanted to, um, so sorry, Greenaway is basically when you solve archive um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Greenaway open, open access when I talk about preference. But before I go there, 
I would like to um, share some useful tools to detect open access. So these may feel overwhelming. You have access to all of this. I don't keep these in my brain. In fact, when I looked at the slides again, I was like, oh, that's right, there's that tool. I forgot about it. So you can have these as a reference and you also just learn and forget about it. But um, I think these are really cool also uh, projects since I wanted to kind of uh, highlight them. So the first one is the Directory of Open Access Journals or DOAJ. And it's a wonderful database that hosts community curated list of open access journals. And we're gonna use that now today in our breakout rooms just to, just to experiment with that and check it out. And they have a new beautiful website. It's just beautiful to navigate through. And the second one is the Open Policy Finder. This has been recently um, uh, kind of relaunched and um, it used to be called Sherpa Romeo for um, the search of open access journals and or Sherpa Juliet for open access uh, um, funders. But right now they put it all under one finder and it's very convenient, it's beautiful. So we're gonna check out that one as well. Others that we're not gonna look at today are this um, share your papers. So you can use as an author to see if the version of um, of, their, of your document can be shared openly. Um, and there is others for readers mostly, but also authors like Unpaywall and open access button that can be used to uh, find open access routes. Like if I, you wanna try to open access your your manuscript, but you're not sure how, um, they, this can give you some suggestions on how to do it uh, and use, for example, preprints or other institutional servers you may not know about. Um, and that this last one, I actually never used it, the journal uh, checker tool by Plan S um, to verify journals against open requirements. I think that this is maybe a little redundant with, with um, Open Policy Finder, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, so great. Those, I shed some light in some tools. This is another one um, that you as an author, um, should, is supposed to help authors understand, um, you know, if you can trust the publisher or like understand more about what's the process of the publisher. I've never used it. Someone recommended it. So if you are an author and you want to publish, I know that some of you have not published yet. You can try it out. I don't remember if it's free, but it's definitely like a free version. Um, and I apologize, I didn't check actually, again, uh, if they changed their, uh, how they, how they, uh, this service. Um, so just put it out there, but I'm not endorsing it. Okay, what I am endorsing though is the OAJ. I love it. So let's find out. I, my question is, is the journal I want to publish in open access? So for example, you know of a journal because you it's in your field and maybe your PI tells you we're gonna publish here and you wanna just ask more questions. So I see that the chat is, do I need to stop? Um, what are the difference between SciHub and ResearchGate and the tools you shared? Oh, hi, Irene. Uh, okay, SciHub, I think re last time I checked, it was no longer available, which made me really sad. So that's an illegal, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great experiment. And I'm endorsing it, um, although this is gonna be published online to the government. I don't know what's gonna happen with it, but um, it's, uh, all right, I'm not endorsing it, but it is a, a tool that uh, was developed um, by a Ukrainian uh, computer scientist, um, a woman, and um, it basically gave open up the access to every, to all the research, um, almost all the research publications uh, that were not open access. So that was basically help break uh, the copyright. Um, so a technically illegal way of accessing research, but free and um, pretty easy to use. I don't know if it's been reestablished. Last time I checked, it wasn't working. Um, so ResearchGate, um, I haven't used it very much. I think you can self-archive, but as an author, um, you, if you self-archive your research on ResearchGate and the publication is not open access, you may also be infringing copyright. So I'm not 100% positive there, but um, it's, yeah, uh, you have to check still if the, if the journal allows you to self-archive yourself on ResearchGate or any other place. Um, and then the tools I shared are just tools to make you understand if it's self-archiving or putting a, your research somewhere 
um, that is openly available, like you post your PDF on your blog, is um, something that the journal will um, allow. Uh, usually journals don't pursue legal routes to against authors that do that, but it's technically not legal to do it unless they allow it. Does that make sense? Is it always changing? The, oh, the domain for, um, yeah, good. All right, so then I'll check it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I want it back because I'm no longer in the university, but um, okay. So what time is it? Okay, we have half an hour. So um, I think I would like to spend maybe no more than 10 minutes on this. Um, and what, I'm, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna have uh, breakout rooms for different kind of journals that we are gonna check, uh, we're gonna kind of go into an exploration um, uh, into seeing, uh, discovering things about this journal. So we're gonna use two tools, UAJ and um, the other one that I forgot now because I used to call it Sherpa Romeo, um, see, and the Open Policy Finder. Uh, the OJ is a database um, of open access journals, and it's um, this is just a slide that I modified from Ivan Lujano, um, who is the um, the uh, community manager at the OJ, wonderful human, um, and uh, shared with us, uh, you know, some facts of the OJ. I really like that they also archive multilingual journals, um, and uh, uh, more than half of the journals archived there are Diamond Open Access, which is the uh, open access that is uh, free for readers and authors from truly all over the world. So what we're going to do, um, so using DOAJ, and then we're going to use uh, the Open Policy Finder. Um, this is new, and DOAJ and formerly called Sherpa used to talk to one another with direct links, but DOAJ is not yet updated to this database. Um, and so we're gonna have this gonna be like a little bit of hiccup, and I'm gonna show you what's gonna happen. Okay, so now listen up. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna click on the OAJ, you each one, so we're gonna go, don't do anything right now, just listen and look at this. Uh, these instructions are also in the notepad. You are gonna click on the OAJ if you can, open it on your browser, and then paste in the name of one of these four journals. If you are in room one, you'll search eLife. If you're in room two, you'll search the South African Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. If you're in room three, History of Geoscience and Space Sciences, or plus one if you're, sorry, oops, typo. If you're in room four, you'll be plus one. So then you'll click and then in, you put that into the search engine of UIJ and then go to the journal. You may have to may require an additional step of like clicking on the journal. Um, and then you'll open up a dashboard with information about that journal. Um, so the dashboard will give you information regarding publication fees, waiver policies, all of these things you're like, what am I doing here? It's, it can feel overwhelming, but I would like to focus on these two things. Like, can you tell if the journal has an author publishing charge, which means does the journal that is open access because it's DOAJ, do they have, um, do, do the author have to publish, have to pay to make the, the their article open access? And it should be information of findable in the dashboard. And then what else do you notice? Is there anything else that you notice in the dashboard that you want to talk about? So that's first step. Then if you scroll down in the dashboard is, um, a little square that this is like all these cards, kind of like a, a board game on the table that says Sherpa Romeo. And this is where the system breaks because they don't have the updated op a link to Open Policy Finder. So you click on Sherpa Romeo and it will, actually you don't need to click on that because it's not gonna work. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna abandon the UAJ website. We're gonna go to the Open Policy Finder, which is also linked. And you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna take that journal, put it in the engine, click search, and new information will show up. And when you go there, you can look up more fun facts about that journal. But specifically, I would like you to look at the copyright. Do the authors retain the copyright? Are there restrictions on self-archiving? And what's the license of the published version? Um, so that sounds like a lot for 10 minutes. 
probably is. So I'm going to stop sharing, go to the notepad. The rooms should be open uh, or starting open soon. I think you're right on it. So here is the notepad for room one, your life. Room two, um, room three and room four. You can use these to note down what you see. Um, these are two websites you need to open in your browser, DOAJ and open policy finder. Um, are there any questions before we move to breakout? If you are in breakout, you're stuck, click your help button and I'll come in and join you. Okay, uh, Jenny, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was uh, such an amazing presentation, uh, so much resources. Uh, the good thing is that we'll be able to get the presentation from you as well. So members, participants, will be yeah. able to get the information. And I have more. I'm not done with the presentation, but we're going to take text minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just want to remind the uh, participants that everyone that uh, uh, there are some guidelines before we join the breakout rooms. Please, please, please make sure you introduce yourself briefly in whatever way you would like to be known by your group. Uh, number two, just be kind enough to your colleagues in that breakout room. Speak one ninth of the time, so make sure that we give space to other colleagues so that they can also speak. Share one thing at a time so that we give space to one another and uh, offer affirmations, clarifying questions and help for suggestions so that we can all learn. And uh, of course, that's what you said, Shania, that uh, make sure that you, if you need any help, just click on the help button. Thank you. Yeah, of course, maybe we might need to go to breakout rooms. Uh, I'm not sure if Irene is a lady for us. Yeah, so the rooms are open. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I didn't offer to. Go ahead, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, so uh, it, it was just a very exciting uh, to hear from the colleagues in the breakout rooms, and the, I was in three. Very exciting. You would like to, uh, participants, to to discuss what um, that meant? I think we don't have a ton of time if I want to cover preference, but I would like maybe like if anyone would like to to share uh, how it went, maybe like a yeah. couple of words from each room, like we can, okay. but I, I, I don't have too much time. Um, okay, so five minutes it is. Yeah. So participants, please, colleagues, uh, if you have anything, just a mute and, uh, and, and speak, please. You can raise up your hand. Just raise up your what, what surprised you? What uh, <laughs> was it? Was it too? I understand there were a lot of mis moving pieces, but is there anything particularly that stuck out? Yeah, please. Okay, uh, there's this one. Please go ahead, as is. Hello, everyone. So, uh, just keep the presentation part. So, what surprised me was uh, about the South African Journal for uh, Obstetric and Gynecology. What actually surprised me is you have to publish, uh, to submit an anonymous uh, text, an anonymous, an anonymous uh, paper, which will be reviewed before being uh, uh, approved for publishing. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I was shocked about that, actually. So I think that would be part of a, a double blind peer review process. So you, uh, the, the reviewers don't know the author's name. Uh, this is the first time I actually don't know that journal very much, uh, but I've uh, done some work with obstetric, obstetrics and gynecology um, folks. So that's, so that's you know, I would guess, my guess would be that, but um, that it's kind of a double blind. Uh, that process of not knowing who the authors are uh, becomes harder with preference. So we're going to see that uh, in just a minute. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Sorry, it was, it was too short of time to really dive deep, but hopefully this gave you kind of a flavor of how you can go back and explore more on your own. Yeah, sure, Dania. Yeah, I think we're running out of time as well. Uh, we have about, uh, okay. is it 15 minutes, 17 yeah. minutes? Maybe you may proceed to the okay. presentation. Okay, and feel free to share. Uh, I hope you had some uh, um, 
again, fruitful conversations in your rooms. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna move to the second part of the title of this <laughs> presentation, which is preference. Sorry, um, Daniel, there, there is yeah. one more hand. Can we can oh, we take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, please proceed. Oh. Yeah, from uh, room one, we look at uh, yep. eLife Jonah. If I miss out anything, others can add. So they charge APC $2,500. They, they have a waiver policy. So they have a license, CCBY, that's the license the journal has. So I believe the authors still have some measure of control over their articles. Then they also, they accept preprints and it has a DOI. So those are some of the things I can, I can remember now. That's Thank great. You. Thank you so much for sharing. And I we haven't talked about licenses too much. I have one slide about that around preprints. Uh, eLife is kind of a particular one. I'm gonna see why. Um, in the in this next 10 minutes. So thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Maybe one more, if anyone wants to share. We right. don't have any. Okay. You may proceed, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. So no, that's not what I want to share. That's what I want to share. Okay. So uh, preference, my favorite part, um, uh, obviously biased, uh, working a pre-review, we, we work only with preprints, but uh, what are preprints? So I'm actually, um, before, well, I guess before we go to the definition, I want to say that preprints are a route to open access. What does that mean? It means that you can, um, uh, you know, if, if you're planning to submit to a journal, I really encourage you to check out those tools, specifically the second one. Um, to see if the journal you intend to submit uh, will be okay with you posting preprints. Most journals right now accept preprints. In fact, some journals require preprints, uh, like eLife. We will not review your manuscript if it's not already posted as a preprint. They only review preprints. But that's, and some other journals like PLOS and different kind of PLOS one. Um, Plus journals will uh, submit the preprint for you if you haven't already done so. But what the green open access route is that basically you are uh, it's part of the idea that you as an author self-archive your research um, and kind of uh, make it available for anyone to read free of charge without the journal um, uh, basically being in the middle of that process. So well, I uh, don't have too much time to ask around, but um, I, uh, if you have not heard what a preprint is, a preprint is a, a usually a fully flash publication with like a whole, like everything you expect in a publication that is um, posted on a preprint server, so posted online um, and by the authors, and it is um, a, usually a, it's licensed open access and it's free to use. Uh, and no cost to the authors. It's usually here for this definition from COPE, um, uh, which is, uh, you can check it out like there, uh, I forgot what it stands for, um, but they, um, I don't actually know of any preprint server who charges authors for posting preprints. So I'm not sure what that usually there is, but um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, this is a slide uh, just to say on the bottom, this is the classic uh, method of submitting. You take your manuscript, you submit it to a journal, and then it gets sent by the author to, if it is, if it is the editor thinks it's a good fit for the journal, they'll send it to two to three reviewers that are usually your colleagues. I mean, colleagues in a sense of like peers um, of people that have some sort of uh, kind of knowledge of the research. Uh, and then they sometimes all reject it, or maybe two of them reject it and one doesn't. And then the journal says, nope next journal. So you have to reformat everything and it just assign it to the second journal. Then the review comes back, you've got to revise it. And then finally, you may have to finally publish it from there or might to send it to a third journal. It like, can take months to years to do this process and it's straining. You want to also move on uh, to your next work um, and also like get credit for it get, and get the research out there so that it can be built upon. 
So what's awesome about preference is that you don't need to wait for all of that to make that research available to others to get feedback, uh, but also to kind of, um, you know, make that knowledge available for others to know. And so uh, through preprint servers in usually less than 48 hours, different preprint servers screen for different things. Uh, but usually, um, you know, they once you pass the checks, basic checks, it gets out. And that really frees and allows for the community to give feedback. And this is, you know, where kind of my work is a pre-review. Um, we are in the business of engaging anyone with a uh, expertise that they want to give into reviewing preference at a point in time in which still matters because they can still be changed. There are versions, there are different versions of preprints that can happen. So these are just another fun uh, picture, but again, I think I, I mean, so in putting them here in the presentation, just for the links for you um, to go and check out, SA Bio is um, a nonprofit uh, that is, whose mission is to promote the value of preprints they have a lot of information in there. So I really allow, uh, encourage you to check out the SA Bio info website um, that will kind of give you all of these different um, uh, definitions and, and uh, ideas around what preprints are and how to use it and how to talk about them uh, if you want to be an ambassador for them. Um, the number of preprints is growing. This is already kind of outdated, um, uh, but especially since the pandemic, um, you know, a lot more preprint server, a lot more authors publish their research as preprints and policies have also changed alongside with more and more journals encouraging and more and more funders encouraging or requiring preprints as we're gonna say in a minute. There are different kinds of preprint servers and you may want to find that one that is right for you. And so here are just some steps and idea. Uh, ESA Bio maintains a directory of preprint servers um, that are different purposes, different topics, um, uh, like slightly different kind of um, uh, checks that these preprint servers do. So check them out um, and find that one that is right for you. Not just for the topic, but also for, um, you know, you can, you can really like look up at who um, citation or you know, citation levels, but also like who, who is the readership in your community. Um, so preprints don't have automatically the most open license. So we haven't talked about licenses. I think you've talked about it in other, um, in other maybe lessons, but this is just real quick. Creative Commons, which is a wonderful organization that provides licenses um, of different kinds. Um, there are you know, preprints can have a CC0. The CC0 is a license um, that basically anyone can read, redo, repurpose. And that's the most open license that you can give to something. Uh, I don't know how many preprint servers actually do that full CC0. Probably not many, because that means that you can reuse the work without even citing the original source. And not a lot of researchers are really okay with that. So the next, I think the most common one in the open space here is CC BY. Um, which in some preprint servers, that's the default. There is no ch choice. You are CC BY, usually CC BY 4.0, which means that you have to cite. Uh, like this image, for example, it is CC BY 4.0. If you want to use it, you're going to cite it. Like I'm doing it from the Sabayo website. Uh, and then it goes all the way to no license, which is a horrible way of doing it because if you, there is no license legally, means that there is no right, all the rights are reserved and nothing can be done with that research um, in the sense of like, except for like, I guess, citing it, but you can't just like uh, build upon it in quite the same way. So the last few slides, uh, these are kind of the addition from last time. Um, as I mentioned, fund, more and more founders are either strongly recommending preference to um, mandating preference and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the last one that uh, followed up, uh, following up like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and another few um, uh, funders that mandate preference. And this is just a snapshot from what they call the policy refresh. And so the Gates Foundation now, all the grantees will have to post preference. And more and more, I think this is gonna come more and more. So I really invite you to get familiar with preprints. Um, and they're awesome. And I think uh, if you have not yet convinced your peers that it's important, just tell them that it's going to become mandatory for them. And it's better if you get familiar with them now. That's my threat. <laughs> um, and the Gates Foundation has also um, you know, started in partnership with F1000, a new preprint server called Verikive or Very 
very kind of, I really don't know how to pronounce it, but um, it will be like verified preprint servers. Uh, they have a few more checks than other preprint servers uh, before they publish it. But the idea is that, um, you know, then, you know, the, the preprint is available for anyone to read um, and then it will allow other groups like such as Preview, of you, for example, and others like Pico peer community in and other preprint review services to um, review the preprints. So last uh, couple of minutes, and well, uh, yes, uh, I wanted to just say that, you know, there are different, all these different parts to open science. We talked about open, open access and preprint in that context, uh, but open peer review is also another big component uh, that is very close to my heart. Um, and I think it's becoming more and more um, important and talked about what does it mean to open peer review? I didn't put any of that content in here, uh, but if you check out pre-review uh, website, we have a ton of resources um, on, uh, not a ton, but we have a few resources on peer review and I'm happy to come back or talk about that if you wish at our um, uh, cohort um, coaching sessions. Um, and uh, it, this review part, but also like the publishes preprint is part of what you may also hear uh, kind of in more, often refer to publish review curate model. Um, here are just some links for you if you wanna read more about them and how they've been implementing. I think that they are shaping a new era of publications and I'm, I'm just very excited about it. And this would be basically part of the diamond of open access where it's free to use, read, or free to the authors, free to publish. Um, and then the community will be more and more empowered to review. Um, and then someone already caught eLife is a big proponent of the publish review curate, they only review preprints. All their preprints are, the preprints are put in preprint servers and they're reviewed by uh, reviewers at eLife. And then the reviews are open, openly available. And um, the reviews are also portable. If someone wants to publish in the end in some one other journals. So it's a really kind of um, a new model. Um, and I'm gonna just cut it short here. Uh, you can also check out Society for the curation of preprint reviews. Um, and preprint reviews are increasing, uh, increasingly becoming popular. This is just a last year or this year actually publication. Uh, if you're curious about learning more about preprint review, uh, this is a good source of information as well. Um, and last but not least, it's a shameless <laughs> page to print review. We are actually very interested in that review part of the PRC model. Uh, we do have persistent identifiers for the review. Uh, it's free to free to publish, so it's a platform in which anyone can review preprints. All the reviews are CC BY licensed, um, and uh, the reviewers get recognition through ORCID, through your persistent identifier. So hopefully you'll find that useful, and I'm here for uh, answering more questions around that. And TOPS is awesome, and their second goal is around review, so yay to bringing more openness and equity to, to reviews. So thank you so much, and... I appreciate you all. Sorry for rushing in the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniela, for those presentations. So insightful, uh, so much information that you've given uh, each one of us. We have been challenged here. Yeah? You have been amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just time has run out, but I wish we had more time to, to discuss about those issues. I wish uh, participants, maybe they also had time to to reflect and they ask questions, uh, but we're learning a lot of time. Uh, yeah, so, Ospe, um, Irene, are you around? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I wanted to invite some reaction from participants, but I'm just looking at the time and, uh, and it seems we're learning a lot of time, but I'm you so have sorry, uh, so much to do. <laughs> No, that's okay, because Daniela <laughs> has coaching sessions still available, yeah. and yeah. I see a question about whether an article should go through open peer review before publishing. That is a, a, an amazing question to discuss with Daniela in the coaching sessions. So mm -hmm. for now, I uh, first I want to thank Austin for the amazing facilitation in this session. Uh, Austin graduated from the pilot, um, and we at the end of the cohort, we invite people to register for facilitation to the next cohort. Um, so speaking about graduation, I have a short announcement to make. Uh, and this is that next week, we are going to learn from you. 
we have been learning from experts and now now that we are we are at the end of the program we would we would like to hear more from you um the share the link that i shared in the chat is the registration for graduation we have the tuesday session and the thursday session uh, so feel free to uh, sign in with your name and i'm going to share my screen very quickly just to um just to give a short explanation of what we expect from graduation. And you see my slides. Yes, okay, thanks. Um, so I, as I was saying, it's just a five minute presentation um, and you're welcome to prepare slides, but you're also welcome to just open your mic and tell us a little bit about your work, about what you learned from the program. Just one key takeaway. Um, the thing that you value the most from the program, and also your next steps. So now that you have this knowledge, how can you apply it to your work? Um, and as I shared the link in, in the in the chat, we we have two sessions, Tuesday and Thursday. So feel free to choose a group. Um, and this is a reminder that um, the presentation is a requirement for receiving the certification. Uh, but please, instead of taking it as an exam or some evaluation, it's nothing like that. It's more for you to celebrate your learning during this program and also to um, just share your learning with the cohort. Um, so I am going to be available for questions later. For now, I'm going to stop my sharing and um, I see there is a question from Rania. Yes. I have one question. I choose to uh, record my presentation. Where to yes. submit it? Okay, so how to submit for, it? Thank you. Um, you can send um, you can send me a link um, if you upload it to maybe Google Drive. Then you can send me a link by email, and then we are going to um, upload that to YouTube as well, just so that your presentation has the same visibility that um, the recording that we're going to do for graduation. May uh, you but yeah, thank you. Send me your email to send it? Yes. Yes, I will write you an email and um, um, we can do that. But thank you for already registering. Um, and yeah, so with that, I think we are at the end of the session. Um, again, just one last reminder that if you want to meet with Daniela for a coaching session, the table uh, for re registration is still, uh, I put it in the link uh, in the chat in the, um, in, here in Zoom. We have uh, still several um, free spots. So feel free to sign in. And um, yeah, some people have already joined. I am hearing that the discussions have been really interested. Uh, but yeah, so that's the end uh, of the session. Next, next week will be the last week. Yeah, so last next week is the last week. Uh, we still have on Thursday a session that is training and is an introduction to GitHub. Um, so we're going to go through the first steps into creating a website by using GitHub, which is the tool that you have, you have been hearing about during the cohort. Um, so hopefully you are also able to join. But yes, next week is our last week and it's um, a week where we are dedicating dedicating all the space um, to learn from you. Yes, kindly don't forget to send you, to send your uh, email. Yes, yes, thank you, Rania. So uh, again, uh, thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Austin, uh, for this great session. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm sorry, Ellen. I'm sorry. Um. I'd like to to ask you uh, about uh, the next uh, because I, I I could not uh, join you as I want because uh, I had the problem there is no electricity here but mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know what about the coaching with the expert yeah so. When you register your name in the table that I shared, I will send an email uh, with the link to join the expert. So if you have already um, 
put your name and wait for an email from me. Um, I will send a calendar invitation with a link to join um, and an email. Um, and so, yeah, that's those are the next steps. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and thank you for a few more minutes for other questions. <laughs>